You know, most people have never read The Origin of Species by Charles Darwin. A lot of people who, who believe in uh, survival of the fittest and social Darwinism uh, call it, never actually read the text that it comes from. It's an interesting book. It's worth, it's worth reading. Uh, one of the misconceptions people have about Charles Darwin uh, is the idea that, um, that, that he came up with this idea of survival of the fittest that it was that it was based in in uh, biology, uh, grounded in in uh, biological science, evolutionary science, and that the idea of, of social Darwinism uh, emerged out of that. Uh, it actually went the other way around. People call it social Darwinism, but uh, before Darwin, it, it, it was called uh, Malthusian economics. Darwin uh, read. The economic theories of this fellow named Thomas Malthus, and Thomas Malthus basically came up with his idea that, that justified uh, white people, English people specifically, in uh, in slavery and genocide, colonization, uh, uh, robbing and murdering, and, and basically doing whatever they want. He came up with with his idea that uh, justified all of that. Uh, and it was very popular among English people and uh, widely accepted in England. And Darwin read that, and that was what inspired him, where he got his idea of, uh, of survival of the fittest, the idea that uh, evolution was driven by this intense competition. Now, um, now, nowadays, uh, evolutionary biologists don't really think that way. It's interesting. You know, I hear a lot of folks who uh, maybe they've read something by Richard Dawkins, or, or, or maybe they, they think of themselves as, as, uh, as skeptics or rationalists or whatever, and they say, oh, well, this is, it's just science that there's... Uh, some being, some people that are superior to others, and, and uh, the, the weak die out, and, uh, and the strong survive. Only the strong survive. And that's just science. The funny thing about the origin of species is that if you, if you actually read it, you actually pay attention to uh, Darwin's uh, observations of interactions between species, you notice that... Uh, there's a in his actual observations there are a lot more uh, references to cooperation between different species than there are uh, references to competition. He he didn't really observe that many uh, uh, examples of competition between species directly. All the stuff about competition that you find in the book is is theoretical. Uh, is his his assumptions of how he expects things to work based off of his readings of Thomas Malthus. Uh, in, his, in his own words, it's uh, the, um, uh, the, the principle of Malthus broadly applied to plant and animal kingdoms. Um, but in his actual observations, time and time again, what you see is different species cooperating uh, to produce stronger... Uh, more sustainable ecosystems, and uh, it's rather funny that he that uh, almost every time he he describes this he uh, he treats it as a, a rare exception to the rule, except that if you add them all up throughout throughout his his writings, you'll notice that there's considerably more exception than there is rule. Now Darwin believed in superiority, but he always had trouble with that. Uh, that's another thing that he talks about in his book. Uh, he says that it's, it's self-evident that uh, some species and some organisms, some individuals, are superior to others. Uh, superiority is a concept that he, he never questions. In his mind, it's, 
It's completely beyond question. It is self-evident. But he was never able to define it to his satisfaction. He was never able to come up with any uh, criteria uh, that, that determined who is or is not superior. That was something that bothered him. It always bothered him. He never, uh, he never figured it out. The closest that he ever got to uh, uh, coming up with a criteria to define superiority was uh, to say that superior organism is one with uh, greater differentiation of organs and tissues, greater differentiation of parts. Uh, he said that uh, just like uh, just like a city that has bakers and tailors and carpenters and poets and uh, many different kinds of people with different uh, skills and, and talents is a, is a superior city to one that uh, consists of bakers only and, uh, and, and nobody who knows how to fix uh, your clothing or, or build a house or, or uh, cook any sort of food that isn't bread. Uh, uh, the same principle applies. Any uh, that uh, more diversity of parts is what is what makes a an organism superior, with with some ex exceptions. Uh, he he said that that was uh, a general principle. It didn't always apply because uh, well, I guess if you were to apply that um, in all cases, then then you would find that there's some species of animals that are superior to humans, so, so he wasn't, so he, he felt that that in itself, since humans in his mind were obviously superior, uh, that was evidence that that, uh, that criteria wasn't 100% uh, accurate, but it was the closest that he ever came to, uh, to defining superiority. Uh, it's a, it, it seems like a bit of a funny, uh, funny definition say that a, a superior being is one with greater differentiation of parts um, because the uh, well the example that he gives of a city with a multitude of people with different skills and talents uh, would suggest that uh, that uh, superiority is more a function of integration than it is uh, something that any individual um, possesses. Because if a city is superior by virtue of having a diversity of, uh, of people, occupants, with a diversity of skills, then, well then, presumably, and, and he, he talks about this as well, that then a, a, an ecosystem is superior in the sense of being uh, more healthy, more stable, more capable of supporting more life. Uh, if it has a greater diversity of, of species in it. So that, that criteria for, uh, for uh, superiority would suggest that, uh, that superiority and diversity are, are uh, very strongly linked, that they're So it, it doesn't really make sense to me that uh, an individual could be regarded as superior. I mean, what would that even mean uh, for an individual to be superior absent that broader community of, of diversity?
I suppose by that criteria, the, the only really truly superior being on this planet would be the planet itself, Gaia. That's the Gaia hypothesis. Uh, that's another way of looking at evolution. But uh, nowadays, nowadays uh, people understand, evolutionary biologists understand that uh, that diversity uh, or that that um, cooperation between diverse species uh, has played a much greater part in evolution than competition ever has. Uh, only a few months ago, some scientists, I think they're Japanese scientists, uh, identified um, identified an organism which they believe uh, is um, the closest living relative to uh, uh, one of the, the very, very early ancestors of all plant and animal life, all, all eukaryotic life. Eukaryotes are uh, uh, um, uh, or, organisms that, that have cells um, with, with a nucleus. So plants, animals, fungi, most, well, a lot of microbes. Basically anything that's not a bacteria, or or what they call an RK. So uh, uh, they believe that the uh, the great evolutionary leap from these from this world of bacteria, single-celled organisms, to more complex organisms, um, with. Uh, uh, um, cell nuclei and, uh, and and organelles and all that. Uh, they believe that this this evolutionary leap uh, occurred with the coming together of bacteria and uh, and RKs. They used to call them RK bacteria, but uh, uh, they don't. They, nowadays they're just called RKs because they. Uh, uh, came to a conclusion that they weren't actually related to the bacteria, that they're completely separate evolutionary lines. So that's that's kind of interesting to think that it was uh, the coming together of two very, very, very different uh, organisms, as as different as they could possibly be, that uh, resulted in in uh, plants and animals and mushrooms and well any form of life that's uh, big enough for you to see uh, as a result of that. So they found this uh, this organism, this RK uh, no, it's, a, it's a member of a, a group of organisms that's called Asgard Cool, cool name Asgard it includes uh, the the Loki Archaeota and the Odin Archaeota and the Heimdall Archaeota. I think there's a Thor Archaeota. Uh, uh, they were found the, these uh, the the first uh, uh, example, the first members of, of this group to ever be identified by scientists were. Uh, uh, found in a thermal vent called Loki's Castle, I think. Uh, so they were named Loki Archaeota, and, and, and so that's how they, that's how the whole group got their, their uh, names, at least in Norse mythology. And this particular uh, Asgardian goes by the name of uh, Candidatus uh, Prometheo Arche Prometheo Archaeum Centropicum. Candidatus Prometheo Archaeum Centropicum. Yeah. Watch out for them as guardians. They are tough to perish. Uh, they figure it was Candidatus Prometheo Archaeum Centropicum, or its ancestor. 
that uh, merged with a, a bacteria somewhere way back when. They're not entirely sure which bacteria they think they were thinking it was a some sort of alpha protobacteria. Uh, Lynn Margulis, who uh, uh, is a really revolutionized the way that uh, you can think about uh, evolution. Although you never see her get credit for it uh, for some reason, Lynn Margulis uh, came up originally uh, came up with the idea of um, she called sequential endosymbiotic theory uh, made the case for for this uh, for this this origin complex life of uh, complex life came from different organisms coming together merging together uh, rather than rather than fighting one another sort of uh, hunger games survival of the fittest situation uh, Lynn Margulis uh, theorized, hypothesized that uh, uh, some sort of spirochete bacteria played a, a, a critical role in uh, in that first merger. She was she was convinced that uh, the the first merger that led eventually led to um, eukaryotic life was between uh, some sort of thermophilic archaea. Uh, which, which uh, Candidatus prometheo archaeum centropicum is, it's a, a thermophilic archaea, so she got that part right. She uh, uh, said it was between some sort of thermophilic archaea and some sort of spirochete bacteria. Now, uh, I think the most widely accepted theories today, as I understand it, uh, don't, don't have much to say about spirochetes. Myself, and I'm no kind of scientist, I'm no kind of uh, uh, evolutionary biologist, but, but uh, I like to believe what I like to believe. Myself, I, I am still, I'm still inclined to, to think that, uh, that Margulis might have had the right idea. Uh, certainly there's, uh, well, it's my understanding that there's structures in, uh, in eukaryotic cells uh, that have a certain resemblance to spirochete bacteria, um, but uh, but uh, these structures aren't as uh, aren't as clearly delineated as say mitochondria are. Uh, I think the the, the, more, the more popular theory nowadays is that. Um, that there was a merger between thermophilic archaea, closely related to Candidatus prometheo archaeum centropicum, uh, and uh, what they call uh, uh, an alpha proto proteo proto an alpha proto bacteria, uh, which is the the relative of mitochondria. So, the, the, as I understand it, that's the the most popular theory nowadays among people who know these sort of things, which I don't. But, uh, uh, they think that, uh, that that was the, the initial merger. But uh, uh, Margulis maintained that uh, the merger with uh, the spirochete bacteria came much earlier, and that might explain why, uh, why the... Uh, uh, those organelles, those structures in the cells that she attributes to uh, spirochetal lineage are, are not so clearly delineated as uh, mitochondria is um, because they've, uh, they've been a part of this, these organisms for longer and they've uh, uh, merged, fused more, they've become, they're more fully integrated into the, the, the whole organism. Whereas mitochondria uh, still have still have the, the shape of alpha protobacteria. They're very they look like bacteria very much so. Now uh, Margulis said that uh, that these spirochetal 
structures, these spirochetal derived structures, uh, included the uh, flagella and cilia, which are like the hairs and tails uh, on the on the outside of, of cells. Um, like a sperm cell has a tail, it's its flagella. Uh, some other cells have cilia, which is lots of little hairs that can, uh, like, uh, well, uh, all, it's, uh, you might have seen it with all the, the uh, news about COVID-19, if you've, if you've looked at um, uh, explanations of how, how that works, uh, one of the things that they, they say is that uh, the, the, the virus uh, damages the, the cilia in your in your lungs, the cilia themselves, the, the little hairs that that are on on the outside of the cells that uh, keep things moving past, kind of pushing things along and help to, to for your debris out of the way. So so the cilia fall off and they uh, they become debris themselves, and then the, the lungs of the, the cells don't have any way of getting rid of that debris. So the debris just just piles up. And bad and then well and then other things happen but that's that's beside the point um so uh there's flagella and cilia uh there's also structures called uh kinetosomes kinetochores um mitotic spindles all these various structures inside the cell that uh uh, work to kind of tease out the DNA um, and, and arrange the, the DNA uh, in such a way that the cell can, can then divide uh, with both sides having uh, the, the same, uh, with both sides having a copy of the, of the DNA. Uh, she argued that uh, that these structures are, are related. There's certain there's certain structural similarities uh, between the, the two, uh, and also, you know, you, you uh, can see that um, that that uh, the similarity to to spirochete bacteria. And it, look, if you look at spirochetes, they're they're little wiggly corkscrew things, and they wiggle around. So, um, and so flagella and cilia. Are like little wiggly things that stick out on the outside of cells, whereas uh, the mitotic spindles are, are little wiggly things on the inside of cells, and they, they wiggle in a more um, in a more coordinated way. But 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 it is a similar it's a similar structure and a similar movement. They they tease out the the DNA. Uh, and then there's other structures that are more derived. They don't uh, they don't resemble uh, spirochetes quite so much, but they have the same, I guess, chemical uh, structure as as the flagella and, and the mitotic spindles. And these are found in the, in uh, neurons among other cells, and uh, well, I don't understand that much about how they work, but, but uh, uh, basically they, they work to, uh, they help, they help to transmit signals that are found in neurons and, uh, and in nerves, and they're uh, chemically similar to uh, flagella and mitotic spindles. And, and the interesting thing about these structures is that uh, any given cell can only have can only have uh, one kind of of these uh, uh, we'll call them spirochetal structures. Uh, so a cell can either have uh, a flagella or or uh, a mitotic spindle. Uh, it can either have the, the hairs on the outside or the tail on the outside that that helps it move around or helps move other things past it. Or it had, or it's able to uh, divide, uh, like like sperm and eggs, right? Uh, sperm has the the tail, and uh, 
eggs have the, the mitotic spindle, the ability to, to divide and to uh, uh, multiply into more cells. There is no, there is no cell, there's no organism in existence uh, that can do both. There are some microbes that can switch back and forth from the one to the other, but there is, there is nothing in existence uh, that can do both. And, and neurons uh, and, and nerves can't, can't do either. So, so that's uh, evidence to suggest that, uh, that these different structures all have uh, uh, the same origin, that uh, each cell can only do, do one thing. I'm not a biologist. Anyway, the main point is that I do get right some tired of folks who have never even read Charles Darwin and don't even know who Lynn Margulis is and have never heard of Candidatus Prometheus Archaeum Syntropicum. Uh, or any of this stuff, claiming that uh, survival of the fittest is some sort of science, because it just isn't. And that's all I have to say. Signing out.